today, and on behalf of, of SMU and the National Center for Arts Research, I thank you very, very much uh, for coming. I guarantee you we're going to change your life today. Uh, and, then, <laughs> I just, and in five years, I am sure we will have changed the dialogue that we are having around um, arts organizations and arts management uh, in this country um, with this exciting project. First of all, thank yous, and we'll get going. Um, first, Victoria Bailey and the Theater Development Fund, who graciously co hosts this event. <laughs> and of course, to Signature Theater for hosting us tonight. We are very, very proud to call Jim Houghton up, SMU Meadows alum, so we're <laughs> thrilled to be here. Thank you to all of you for coming today. Um, this is a wonderful representation of arts managers from across the city and from different sectors. Um, a testament, I'm sure, to all the pressures we are all feeling uh, for new solutions in a challenging arts environment. So our goal um, at the National Center for Arts Research and at SMU uh, is to be uh, a convener, to do what universities do best, which is research. So, um, as you'll hear today, we have amassed the largest arts database uh, in the country, <clears throat> but that's not the important bit. <clears throat> the important bit is that it's a usable tool for all of you in the field to be able to use um, every day. Um, people think, well, just because you're in the arts, somehow, you know, you're, you're not a data person. Um, but we are all data people. We have to be. Um, and so what we want to do is make sure that the artists in our organizations can make the art. Somebody's got to be counting the bills. So we have a wonderful board. Um, some of you are here today. Um, but I want to thank our national advisory board, um, Naomi Grable from Carnegie Hall, Kevin Moore from PCG, Woo! David Reston, you all know David, Jill Robinson from TRG Arts, Rebecca Thomas from the Nonprofit Finance Fund, and Beth Tuttle from the Cultural Data Project. Thank you for your time today. <laughs> and that's it for the chit chat. So um, I'm now very, very pleased to introduce someone I think many, many of you know, uh, the foremost uh, researcher uh, in this field, um, uh, a theater professional herself. Um, she has a joint appointment in the Cox School of Business at SMU and the Meadows School of the Arts. She runs our wildly important and popular um, arts management and arts entrepreneurship program, which includes everything from um, a, a Mamba, which is an MA plus an MBA. Um, it's a Mamba. We have a couple of Mamba grads here today, um, but also the first arts entrepreneurship minor in the country, um, which is leading us to have the highest employment for our graduates, our undergraduates, in the arts. Um, because when they graduate, they not only have art skills, they also know how to run a small business because, as you all know, um, most artists are going to be freelancers. <laughs> so um, she runs all of this in her spare time. She also directs the National Center for Arts Research. Please help me welcome Zani Voss. with 
Boston Consulting Group and did a lot of field research before getting started. And this is kind of where our feet were held to the fire. It can't just be providing the insights, but we have to figure out how do you get from the insights to enablement. What is it that we can do that will be useful and relevant for arts and cultural organizations? And the mission is really what has driven our scope. So there are many partners out there, there are many data gatherers currently. We really don't need to get into the business of collecting data. What we want to work is the analysis and the insights that will enable. So the practical tools, the resources that we're able to provide. Where we're stopping short as a center is that we are not getting into implementation. We really don't, we're not trying to be a consulting firm that goes one-on-one -on -one with individual organizations. We're researchers and that's where we're trying to invest all of our time. There are so many wonderful consultants, uh, wonderful smart individuals out there in the field who can help to provide the implementation. And so we're happy to pass the baton to them. Looking at trying to accomplish the scope meant that we had to start with a lot of different partners. And so currently our partners are Cultural Data Project. We have all of the Cultural Data Project's data for the past five years on all arts organizations around the country. Theater Communications Group, so we have the data from TCG's Fiscal and Attendance Survey. Uh, and the National Center for Charitable Statistics, uh, we have data on the 40,000 organizations that report through NCCS. Now the CDP and TCG take a really deep dive in terms of the kinds of data they collect. And those of you here who have to complete the CDP know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that's at the organizational level. We have in total, uh, so we have five years of information. So 230,000 organizational records, which is about 15,000 unique organizations, some of whom we followed over time. For cultural policy information, we have the National Endowment for the Arts data, IMLS, <coughs> National Assembly of State Arts Agencies. We also have the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts data from the NEA. But then we also wanted to get the Census Bureau, because we wanted to look at community involvement and characteristics of communities. And then to help us think through ideas, nonprofit finance fund, TRG Arts, and IVM. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in just a minute. And so once we have our hands on all of this data, you need to think about, okay, well, how do you organize it? And so the way we've decided to organize it is by modeling the arts and cultural ecosystem. Because when you think of it, arts organizations don't exist in a vacuum. You know, our health isn't only dependent on the activities, practices, and decisions that are happening internally. It's really this complex, interdependent system of understanding what's happening in the community around you. So what are the socioeconomic characteristics of your local community, the, the demographic characteristics? Who else is operating in the market? So are there you know, other businesses? Are there zoos, aquariums, parks? How many other arts organizations are operating in the market? And then what's the impact of the cultural policy on an organization's ability to perform well. And then the health and dynamism of the, the supply, you know, of looking at the very artists who are responsible for creating the work. You can see that we've then mapped from all of our different partner organizations representation that takes us through each of the parts of the ecosystem. So we've been able to interconnect the data to make it talk to one another. And for us, we kind of stepped back and thought, well, you know, an, an arts organization that's operating, you know, say in Queens, the, the Jamaica Performing Arts Center, it's probably not as likely to attract everybody from out the New York metro area. It's most likely to attract those who are in its local community. So what we did is we geocoded, meaning we, we placed each arts organization in the country in its, in its location, and then we gave it a sense of place. So this is a, an example. We did something called spatial modeling, where you decide to what your, your uh, diameter is going to be. You know, for us, we looked at one kilometer, thinking within one kilometer, those community characteristics, the people who live in the community, the competing organizations, the complementing organizations, get the most weight. And then as you move increasingly distant from the organization, we still take into account the characteristics, but we simply weight them a little bit lower. And the attempt, again, is really to understand what drives performance. So to what extent do these different characteristics affect the performance for this ABC orchestra? 
So now that we have each of the organizations placed and we understand where it's operating, we can really get going on the research. For us, having the data meant if we're going to achieve our mission, what are the important questions that we need to ask about health? What are the important questions we need to ask about impact? And as a bunch of researchers sitting together, we can come up with our ideas of what's important to examine. But what was really enlightening to us was talking with a group of about a dozen or so arts leaders from various sectors about how do they look at health in their own organizations. Many of you are, are here today. In addition, we thought through all the financial measures with Rebecca Thomas from Nonprofit Finance Fund to make sure that we were looking at things we really should be looking at to look at health. TRG Arts worked with us uh, in terms of thinking through what we needed to think through for arts consumption. And it all boils down to one of nine different buckets of health. We're looking at contributed revenue, earned revenue, and expenses, as you would expect. Looking at marketing impact and bottom line. We want to get a sense of the health of the capital structure, so we're looking at balance sheet, community engagement, program activity, and staffing. In total, though, in talking with all of the, the different individuals with whom we spoke, we actually came up with 184 different ways to measure health. I mean, it just talks to how diverse we are as a sector. Now, I'm not going to put you through 184 different findings tonight. Uh, in this first report, we decided we're going to tackle eight of them. So once we ask the question, you have to figure out, if I wanted to answer this question, what outcomes would I look at in order to answer it, and look at the data to answer it. So this is an example. What is program revenue per in-person attendee? And when we talk about program revenue, the way that we defined it was not just what did the organization receive in earned revenue because someone bought a ticket. It's also what did they spend on the ticket, but what also did they spend at concessions? Did they pay for parking and that revenue came to your organization? Was there tuition for educational classes? Uh, was there corporate sponsorships that you got because somebody was walking through the door? So pooling that all together for the program revenue. And we want to look at this in three ways. For each of these indices, we look at what was average performance, what drives performance, from within the arts and cultural ecosystem, and then what drives high performance. So let's start looking at some performance averages. These are some of the findings from within the first report. report. We're going to look by sector, by size, and by market cluster. And so this was a look at net program revenue per sector. So we've got program revenue for in-person attendee, as well as marketing expenses, which includes, in this case, uh, marketing personnel per attendee. And you can see things like, over here, you know, Opera clearly earns a whole lot of program revenue for everybody who walks in the door. But they also spend the highest amount for every person who comes. As opposed to, for example, the community-based organizations, which only earn 410, but they also only spend $1.42 for every person that's brought in. What surprised me a little bit was actually the similarities in program revenue between art museums and theater companies. I would not have necessarily expected that to be the case. But you think of museums and all of the gift shops and the, the ancillary purchasing that can go on. And it, it's just a, you're coming from different sources. And so if I look at the difference between the two, I can look at, for the marketing investment, what's the earned revenue that's coming in because of that person. And we see that there were pretty big differences between the arts sectors with respect to net program revenue. You know, when I first looked at this, I thought, well, gee, if Opera's bringing in that much per person in earned revenue, then maybe they're really heavily reliant on earned revenue. But they're not. Within Opera companies, the average is 60% of the budget coming from contributed revenue, which is actually the same as other museums, which are science museums, natural history museums, etc. But these other museums attract five times the annual average attendance as would an opera company. So you just start getting a, a different sense of texture on what's happening between the different sectors. With respect to community engagement, in the first report, we looked at engagement indices, which are these red bars. And we decided on our first foray that when we looked at community engagement, we wanted to include everybody who had a touch point with the organization. So did they come in the door? Did they consume some sort of digitally offered programming in a virtual space? 
Was it a recording? Uh, how many volunteers, board members, donors? What are the total touch points? In the second report, which will be coming out in May, we've started examining already. And what we found, if you remove the virtual attendance, you get those blue bars instead in terms of community engagement per the local population. And what you start to see is how much more some of the sectors are engaging in digital activity than other sectors, mm -hmm. and what kind of an impact that has in terms of reach. So it's really, to me, sort of provocative to start saying, well, for the sectors that aren't engaging, you know, are there ways that they could be engaging that still might be with, with mission? This is the amount of, pro of uh, salaries that are going to artists and other program-related personnel. So in the case of museums, also includes curators, uh, collectionists. So we get a sense then, yes, opera had really high earned revenue per person, but it also has 60% of its total operating revenue going to paying the people who create the art. And in symphony orchestras, that figure is 63%. Uh, you start to see where the investments are, are different between the different sectors. Bottom line, what's the difference between bottom line between the sectors? Uh, clearly, museums, with respect to bottom line, are struggling more so than some of the other sectors, particularly after you take into account depreciation, so it's looking at bottom line before and after depreciation. What surprised me was that the art museums and the other performing arts organizations, which all tend to be smaller, actually were healthier when it came to bottom line. What's curious when you come to museums, though, is even though the bottom line was negative, they had higher positive working capital than the other sectors. So just in terms of the strategy behind how they're operating. If instead we look by size, we see that small organizations tend to have healthier bottom lines than do medium-sized organizations, than do larger organizations. So I'm really curious to delve deeper into figuring out why that is. What happens? Is it because you start increasing your commitments to capital and to having to operate a building and all of the other fixed costs that really make it more difficult to remain stable? Small versus medium versus large. Clearly, medium-sized organizations spend a little bit more on marketing than do large organizations. But there's so much more program revenue returned on that investment of marketing expenditures. And it gets even more extreme when you look at large organizations. So it makes me wonder, is a key to growing from being a small organization to a medium-sized organization, learning something about how to spend a little bit more in marketing, but generating a much higher return in terms of the program revenue? We also looked geographically at differences. And we said, let's not predetermine what we compare, but we'll let, let's have the data tell us where there are clusters of organizations. So what we did was looked at population, median income. Uh, we looked at number of competitors, arts organization competitors within a market, and local funding levels. And what we found is that there are five markets, very large markets, that don't compare to anyone else, and they don't compare to each other. They're totally standalone markets. San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, and DC. If you go on from there, there's a cluster of large markets. And these tend to be large more in terms of population than they do in terms of density of competition of arts organizations. Uh, then you get into medium-sized markets. There were 16 within the, the CP and TCG data. Small markets and very small markets. In total, there are 189 different markets that we are examining through the research. And some of them, when you think about the spatial modeling, what you see is some really small markets, like up there with Ann Arbor, it's actually kind of drafting off of Detroit, or maybe in the case of Detroit, it's working in the opposite way, I'm not sure. Um, Santa Barbara with Los Angeles, you know, that, that's certainly the case. So looking at some of the dynamics of the health of those very small markets that are located close to really large markets. Some summary findings with respect to geography. Arts and cultural dollar activity per capita are actually the highest was in San Francisco. I was expecting that it was gonna be in New York, but it was San Francisco followed by New York. Um, I also thought it was really interesting that these medium-sized markets had higher arts and cultural dollar activity than did Los Angeles arts and cultural organizations. 
Uh, average budget size, Washington, you think all of the, the large cultural institutions that are government supported, followed by New York. The New York City arts organizations of all of the markets had the most pressing deficit, both before and after depreciation. Some of you I've seen heads shaking probably <laughs> more intimate with the, that finding than I am. Um, the large markets, before depreciation, had the highest positive levels of bottom line. Interestingly, if you took into account depreciation, they were no longer the highest, which speaks to me of all of the recent capital investments they've made in arts districts and in bricks and mortar. Attendance. So this is the amount of marketing expenses it takes to bring in a person. Look how much more Los Angeles has to struggle to bring in a person versus Chicago or New York. You, you look at that and it's easy to see the dynamic of, of urban sprawl and how difficult it is to get people to invest in the commute time to actually come. So after we get away from averages, we look at what drives performance and what drives high performance. And this is where it starts getting exciting from our standpoint. When we look at something, and sticking with the example of attendance, we want to be able to explain variations in attendance. Why do some arts organizations have higher or lower attendance than others? And you know, one thing we, that explains it is arts and cultural sector. We know that on average annually, art museums have higher average attendance than do symphony orchestras, than do dance companies. So one thing that I want to look at if I want to understand attendance is I have to take into account what sector it's operating in. But there's actually a lot of things I need to take into account from within that bigger arts and cultural ecosystem. And what we found, to get a level playing field, is that yes, the sector matters. But organizations that have larger operating budgets, of course that affects it, so does organizational age. So older organizations tend to have higher attendance. Those with more square footage. Doing premieres increases attendance. Whether it's local premieres, national, or world premieres, tends to have a positive kick. The higher the median price, the lower the attendance, but the higher the program revenue. Target audience. What we found, and this was actually something that was encouraged by one of my advisory board members, Annette Drew, who runs Dallas Black Dance Theater. She says, don't you dare compare my organization to a, a big white institutional organization. You have to take into account the fact that we simply look different in terms of how we relate to community. And it played out in what we found, that the arts organizations that target African Americans simply have a smaller footprint. There's a lot of excellence that still happens, but on average, the attendance levels are lower. Within the community, when we talk about the grade of the audience, you would expect that median age would strongly affect attendance, and it's not true. The higher the median age in the market, the lower the attendance. So when we think about arts and culture, really with the spectrum of arts and culture, uh, it, it's not that everybody really wants to locate just north of Tampa, Florida. You know, that, that, that having diversity with age in the community is actually more positive, clearly, than having people who are older. More graduate degrees. I thought, you know, education is going to relate. Education does drive attendance, but really only through the undergraduate. I'm not sure exactly what happens. This is worthy of further, further exploration of, you know, if you get a graduate degree, do you just become so fixated and focused on your area of specialization that you don't spend as much time exploring interests in other areas? Uh, commute times are bad for attendance. Sports teams and cinemas compete. The more sports teams and cinemas there are in the market, the lower the attendance. It's direct competition. By contrast, one thing you don't see up here is number of other arts organizations operating within the sector. The more <coughs> organizations operating within the sector did not have a negative impact on attendance. Federal grants across the board for every outcome measure, receiving an NEA or IMLS grant was good for every one of the eight performance measures. It's kind of that imprimatur effect that we've all heard and talked about for a long time, but actually seeing it come into play. So this is controlling, this is trying to get to a level playing field. We want to be able to say, all else being equal, 
have we explained everything that we can explain that's going to drive attendance? And what we find is, no, that's not true. There's all of these other factors from within the ecosystem. There's part of it that remains unexplained. But we don't want to just let it go at that. Because we know within our own organizations, yeah, there's, there's the local community, there's the decisions we make. But when we look around and think about ourselves and our peers, why is it that some organizations are high performers? You know, we thought kind of deeply about this, and really what it comes down to is that intangible. It's the quality of the decision making, it's the quality of the talent, it's the relationships that you've built over time in a community. It's the stuff that you really have a difficult time just putting a number on, but we are able to estimate it. And so, what drives high performance is really these key intangible performance indicators. It's, it's the intangibles. Once you level the playing field, they have some organizations rising above. In trying to understand this, we went back to some of our initial conversations with people before we got started, when we were just trying to explore talking about the field and how people uh, understood high performance. And these were some of the quotes. The X Museum has realized how to leverage its brand and create more consistent revenue streams. We surveyed audiences and quality was the number one reason they come. It's the same reason we can hire the artists we want. True leadership is tapping the full potential of intangible resources like reputation, constantly looking to learn new skills, capabilities. Much of our success should be attributed to consistent leadership. So not having a lot of turnover. It's allowed us to build deep relationships in the community and a great reputation. And my favorite was, it's about getting your mojo working. <laughs> So after we've understood how to get to average, how do we understand how to get to above average? And really, that's what we're trying to do. We want to say, based on all the factors from within the arts and cultural ecosystem that are observable and measurable, the dark line is average performance, and these X's are actual arts organizations. How do we understand better those organizations that perform that far above the line. And it's not prescriptive that everybody wants to perform really high on every measure, but deciding for yourself which ones are really important and where do you want to strive. And so within high performance, we're able to provide an estimate based on something we call high performance, it's actually a stochastic frontier analysis, of understanding how to measure where an organization is versus the average, given all of its characteristics. Organizations that are way up here, a score of 100, those that are at the bottom receive a score of zero. And what we find, again, is that it's really up to the organization. Now, we're not going to be sharing these scores with anybody who wants to see them on your organization. Uh, the scores will be provided through a project that we're working on with IBM. And it's going to be an online dashboard where if you're already a participant in the Cultural Data Project, you just need to log in to your account in the Cultural Data Project and your scores will appear. So you'll get to see, relative to the field, relative to given your sector, your community, et cetera, how's your performance? Where do you want to invest? And to give a little bit better sense of how these play out, so these are two real art museums. One of them, down there, brings in 100,000 people, spends a little bit less than 200,000 per year to do so. Up here you have an art museum. It has the exact same score, just about one point off, but it's bringing in 500,000 people. And so you would think, well, wh wh why did you give them the same score? It's because within an organizational characteristic standpoint, this one is 40 times the size of this organization. It provides twice as much program offerings. It has a lower average admission fee. And it's spending more for bringing in each attendee. So again, this is where we're getting into all those being equal. This organization here should be bringing in a lot more than 500,000 people per year in order to get to excellence. So this is just a mock-up. This is what the dashboard will look like. We've been working with IBM on a weekly basis. Uh, this is a real organization. So for its scores, it's doing really well on contributed revenue. If I'm the manager of this organization and I'm looking at it, I think, okay, staffing, I know I'm way, way undercapitalized, in terms, so I, I know that's a problem. I'm not going to deal with that right now. But maybe I want to look at marketing impact, because I thought I was having a better marketing impact than that. 
And we know that the marketing impact is made up of the physical attendance divided by the marketing expenses. So I want to say, you know, which of those is really the issue here? First, I want to look, have I always had this score? And I can see from within the data that actually it's gotten worse over time. And I look at my physical attendance and my score on the attendance, it is kind of stable. It's actually a little bit improved in the last year. But when I pick that apart and I look at the marketing expenditures, I look, my score has been declining from 44 to 33 to 24 over time. So what is it about the way that I'm spending my marketing now where for the increased spend, I'm not seeing the increase in attendance that should go with it? So that's the, the idea behind this being really just a diagnostic tool to help you see where are the pressure points to help enable you to understand a little bit better relative to the field, where can excellence happen? So a sense of place, these are some of the things we learned from the first report about ourselves and about the data. You know the characteristics of your community. How much new work makes a difference? Unrestricted contributions actually went up with the number of national premieres, but down with the number of local premieres. So it seems as though funders are really supportive of the really new new work, but less supportive of a local premiere. Premieres of all kinds of attendance and total engagement. Invest in development. Um, a good friend at a, a theater in Chicago encouraged me to look at this because from his perspective, if he invests in marketing people, everything gets better. And we kind of saw this. It does pay off, at least to higher contributed revenue and operating revenue like you would expect, but also more offerings and more total engagement. So the additional revenue that's generated is getting invested in more programs. Invest in the art. Organizations that hire more artists and program personnel have higher program revenue and total operating revenue. Raise the tide. Don't be as concerned about competing arts organizations and the ability to share lists, the ability, because what we're finding is that there is some competition with respect to contributions to contributed revenue. However, more within sector competition does not lead to lower attendance or to lower engagement. Compete for the NEA and IMLS grants, they pay off everywhere. And the power of intangibles. You know, how do you raise the bar, given what you know about your characteristics within the organization and within the community? This is what we're doing currently. We have the online discussion forum, social media. We have the industry report that came out in December. There'll be another one that will come out in May where we're going to look at another set of outcome measures and compare them to what we did in the first report. White papers, we recently had a white paper that came out um, about whether or not there was a wealth transfer from poor to wealthier individuals uh, in communities where there is any funding. Symposia, the online tools and templates. In the first year, we started out with some initial funding, and, and we're currently right here. We've done the initial research and dissemination. We've built resources and tools with IBM. We work with them every week. The dashboard will be launched this summer. And I'm very pleased uh, because in this first period, we don't want to just be a bunch of researchers working together. We need knowledge from the field. And we need a good sounding board on a regular basis. And we now, as of this week, um, have our first NCAR fellow, and it's Kate Levin. I'm sure all of you in the room know Kate Levin, the former um, Cultural Affairs Commissioner for the City of New York. She's agreed to help to keep us useful, help to keep us relevant, uh, and make sure that we're listening to the field. And we're really excited to have her as part of our team. And that's what we're up to. I'm happy to take any questions, or if Jose, um, if questions for Jose, please direct all of the hard questions to him. <laughs> Can you define um, financially how you define small, medium, and large? Or did it vary with um, sector? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. The question was, how did we define small, medium, and large, and did it vary with sector? We actually let the data tell us where small, medium, and large happened for each sector. So if you look at outcomes, there are change, change points per sector. Uh, so it, it is a different budget group set, depending on which of the sectors we're talking about. You know, clearly for dance companies, it was going to be very, very different than it is for art museums. So we didn't want to do sort of a one-size-fits-all assumption that across sectors, all organizations were going to um, behave the same. 
Uh, as we continue to add new sources of data, as CDP continues to expand, as we continue to work with other providers of data, you know, that may change exactly where those change points happen because as new organizations come online, uh, they alter the landscape and we're doing our best to try and accurately reflect what it is that the data has to tell us. Is there, can you get that information? It's all available online. Jose right now is showing, this is the NCAR website. Um, and sorry, I wasn't able to show it just because you can only use the laptop back there. Uh, so these are the same uh, outcome measures that I talked about. So for instance, with arts sectors and earned revenue, Jose, if you would just hover over one of the findings. So this is giving what they are, but we also show on average for that sector what was average program revenue and what was average total in-person attendance. So you can also get a sense not only for, you know, from the ratio standpoint, but for the numerator and denominator, where, where is your organization. Uh, by size, we provide what those are per sector on the site. By geography, we show uh, the different performance drivers. And if you're the kind of person who says, this is all great, but I don't really care about all those other sectors, I just care about my own. You can just say, want to see all the index averages by geographic market cluster, or by sector, or by size. And within the introduction to the report, there's a lot of information for how we defined everything, all of the methodologies there. And for the stuff that we thought was really hard to explain, we also did some short videos, because we thought maybe some people would rather just hear it from the person than having to read a, a dense document. How do you define um, how do you define program activity in relationship to an art museum? So program activity for all organizations it, it is admissions. It's also if there are concessions, if there's a restaurant, uh, if there is a gift shop, if there's parking, uh, if there are corporate sponsors where the, it's, the corporate sponsorship funds come in through earned revenue and it's because it is marketing for the corporation based on people who come. Again. The indices are not prescriptive, so ultimately, if I am an art museum that has a free admissions policy, and I don't charge any tuition for my education courses, and I don't really have a store or a, any kind of concession, I may actually want to have a low score on that measure, because that really fits with my mission a lot more than trying to strive for a higher score. These aren't prescriptive, this is simply information about what's out there in the field. And it's really up to each organization to determine which of these are most mission relevant. Uh, yes, back there. Hi, it's Andy. Michael Robertson from Alert Play Development Center. I'm curious, is there, there, is there anything in the data that talks about the effect on artists of where we are in the field? Specifically, I, first of all, I love this, and I've played with this, and I'm like such a data geek. I'm so excited <laughs> about this. But I'm really disturbed by one thing, which is the fetishization of the premiere especially in the theater. So the idea that you get the first production and you never get another one. So I know mm -hmm. this isn't a study about artists, but I'm really, I'm, I, you know, it concerns me that that would become one of the five tenets of being a healthy organization is to do premiere, do premiere, do premiere, because I think that leaves the artist with no career, right? Okay. So you can get one production and, and nothing goes further. So I'm curious about sort of the, sure. this is about the institution, but how the artist fits into this picture. Well, it, it, it's a, Great question. Um, so sort of the premier itis. The one area within the ecosystem, right now in terms of the individual artists, independent artists, I mean, we know how essential it is to take that into consideration. So yes, we're from a mission standpoint about the, the health and, and helping to enable arts and cultural leaders, but we know that you don't have healthy arts organizations if you don't have a healthy and dynamic ecosystem with artists. It's the one area where we need more data. You know, of all of the areas, we need more data everywhere. But right now, the only data that we have on individual artists comes from the Census Bureau, the self-report of individual artists in the market. Uh, we would love to be able to get a better sense of the livelihood, of the sustainability of independent artists, regardless of sector, uh, and how that interplays within that complex and interdependent relationships with the organizations and the rest of the community. So thank you for the, the question. Yes. Oh, uh, I was just going to ask if you talk a little bit about correlation and causation in determining what drives what. Mm -hmm. So correlation, we, we did not conduct correlation analysis in this instance. 
Okay? We conducted, so when I talked about uh, the what explains performance, what are all those factors from within the ecosystem, <coughs> it was a regression analysis. So it is association, but it's trying to get at causation. Uh, when we looked at the high performance indicators, what that does is take the output from the regression analysis saying, let's take into account everything we can explain and then look for high performance. And that was a stochastic frontier analysis. <coughs> uh, so correlation, we did use correlation analysis in a recent white paper that we did with the National Endowment for the Arts. Quite frankly, we have data to do the regression analysis. And what you find is there are a lot of other factors that are so much more important than median income that drive attendance. Uh, that when you look at it from that standpoint and control for everything, we were trying to show a simple correlation so we could tell a simple story based on facts. Um, so you know, looking at correlations, it, it's not to say that correlation is causation. And there is a big difference there. So, uh, first year. Okay. Um, I was just curious, for organizations that fall into maybe multiple of these art sectors, mm -hmm. how did you determine where they fall and, and where their numbers? Okay, so can you go back to the presentation? Just down at the bottom. self-reports what NTEE code it is, okay? So we did it by NTEE code. So you can see what is included in the arts education organizations. This is all available on the website. You know, art museums, we did this through a cluster analysis. So where they come together on about five different <coughs> measures is how we examine them. You know, opera, symphony, orchestra, theater, those were standalone. Others like community included multi-purpose organizations, uh, cultural awareness, folk arts, arts and humanities councils, community celebrations and visual arts oftentimes you see within um, local arts councils, there's also a gallery, you know, that, that is a non-profit, so that kind of activity got captured there. Other museums, there's a whole host of other ones. So we, again, we're not trying to be prescriptive of saying this organization, you are this kind of organization. We let them tell us what kind of organization they were, and that was the, the genesis of it. Find that education was a better predictor than income? <laughs> for this one outcome measure for attendance, because we looked across a whole spectrum of them in different, uh, in different cases, you'll find that income has a different impact than does education. So, for example, if I look at the contributed revenue outcome, which was contributed, uh, unrestricted contributed revenue to expenses, what we find, because uh, I think of the performance drivers, and scroll down, you can scroll down over there. And actually, there you do get, a, a contributed revenue is impacted more by having households with income of 200,000 and above. <clears throat> what you don't find is that those households then necessarily attend. So it depends on which of the outcome measures you're referring to. Uh, you find on the site, for each of the numerators and denominators, we provide the whole listing of all of the drivers from which it's within each of the parts of the ecosystem that we examine, and whether they're positive or negative related with each of the outcomes. And there's also a button at the top, if you look at this and your eyes just glaze over, it says, want to see this in narrative form? <laughs> just written out in the sentences. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we tried really hard with the site to um, put ourselves in your shoes. You know, there are going to be some data geeks, like a friend from LARC, that really enjoy being able to get into that. Other people are looking for just telling me what the story is. I don't need to see all those numbers. And we've tried our hardest to, to make that possible to satisfy people regardless of what their relation is. Uh, <coughs> I'm just saying you calculated the marketing impact based on your marketing expenses, but yes, spending a lot of money doesn't prove the 
like you know, performance of the marketing itself. So mm -hmm. is there any way to assess the marketing quality instead of the marketing expenses? Um, it, it's a great question and what we believe will happen. Yeah. So I gave the example of the dashboard. <coughs> and I think it's not just about the money, but I think where you see the quality of how the marketing gets spent comes within those key intangible performance indicator scores, the KIPI scores. Because it's saying, for your budget size, for your sector, for the community you're operating in, this is what we'd expect to be average. For those organizations that do a lot better than average with a similar spend, it's got to be something about the quality of the way they're spending the money. Is it the channels? Is it how well they communicate with a particular target audience? Uh, you know, so those are all things that we think we're capturing here. Even if you look at the explained variation and if you look at the unexplained variation, the kippies, for some of these, there's still a little bit of random variation. There's some things that even with these two measures, you don't capture absolutely everything. Part of it is because, I think, there's misreporting. You know that some organizations are reporting some numbers that don't necessarily make sense within the context of their online conditions. Other things, you know, when you look at something like attendance, there's just weird things that happen that are totally out of anyone's predictive control, like rotten weather. You know, so how would you capture the impact of rotten weather? Uh, that's where some of the random, the, the random variation comes into play. And in the report, we show for each of these measures how much we are able to explain uh, by each of the, the different components. Are all the organizations nonprofits? Uh, are all the organizations nonprofits? Yes, they are. But, and so, but to drill down. Performing arts centers, if they're presenting, if they're presenting for-profit material, right. but they're funding as a nonprofit, then we have their. And it's in so Broadway, across America, and in performing, and performing mm -hmm. arts center is in there. Right. But Broadway is not. Broadway is not in there. Uh, the thing that is in there that's related to Broadway is we do have a number of Broadway visitors. We actually went and found the data because we figured that for the New York market that has such a big impact as another competitive factor that we have to take it into account somehow. So that's the only commercial activity. When it comes to competing activity, we, we want to explore whether different other organizations within the community are complements. So the more of them they are, the better off everybody is versus substitutes of if they're going to do well, then you're going to do bad. Uh, you know, surprisingly, things like uh, public broadcasting stations, not nonprofit media, I would have expected a really big bump on our performance measures because you think it's a similar audience, if they're interested in, in nonprofit media, they're going to be interested in attending arts events. And in fact, it was the reverse. And the only thing I can imagine with that, it's just worthy of more exploration, is the notion that when people sit at home and watch a performance on television, for them, they just consume art, the arts. But they're staying at home and doing it instead of going out and mm -hmm. participating as a live audience member. Uh, I just think it's a it's an area that's right for a lot more exploration, as I do most of these findings. Uh, part of what we wanted to do with the fellow, and we hope to add more fellows in the future, is to say, find five findings here that interest <laughs> you, and think if there are two of them where you would really just want to write about it, or you want to be able to comment you know, from the field help us all to better understand what it is that the data is telling us. Would you say a little bit more about the correlation between density of opportunity and attendance? As especially thinking about the New York market and where you mm -hmm. came to the conclusion that, okay, too many arts organizations competing in a big space mm -hmm. will affect contributed income, but not necessarily attendance. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about how you came up with that. We let the data, so okay. the question was, mm -hmm. you know, why is it that attendance doesn't go down the more arts organizations per sector operating in a market? Uh, again, we're simply looking at what is the data telling us. You know, if you talk to people from TRG Arts, mm -hmm. they have a lot of experience around the country, and there's the sense that, you know, the, the more attenders there are, the more attenders there are. You know, that it develops, we're, we're still at a point of being kind of an oligopoly yeah. where <coughs> it, it just develops more people who are interested in going out. If I went to your organization, then maybe I'd also consider going to another museum. Versus if there's only one, and it's 
not my flavor, then I'm just not going to go to museums. Uh, as opposed to you know, looking at other factors, what we did find, regardless of measure, the more operating revenue per sector in a market. So if museums, for example, in New York, if I looked at the total operating revenue of all of the museums, uh, that's good for every museum in that market on every measure. So even if there are, you know, there's a market where <coughs> there are a small number of players but a lot of revenue, and when I look at the revenue side of it, it's really more of a demand issue. The organizations were able to get large because there was enough demand in that market for that entity. That means it's a pretty good and healthy environment for people who want more of that thing. Uh, so you know, to try and encourage that rather than discourage other players, that there's more to be gained by cooperating. One more question and two more questions. I can't try to tie down. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jenny Lillard, of New York, and I've been studying numbers for a long time, just with our 350 members. And I'm really intrigued by your comment about age and size because we've seen that um, there's the first generation theaters that were created in the 70s and their first musical grants were $50,000. And then there's the fourth generation theaters whose first musical grants are $500. And so depending on when you were founded, there was more money to get you started and it seems like you got this head start. Mm. And so I wondered if you could talk about that because is, does that mean that for the small, what I'm worried about the mid, the groups in the middle because the smaller groups can survive as avocational, although they don't want to, but once they become an institution, whether it's they rent an office or they build a space, suddenly something happens. And they don't all get big just because they build a space as your balance sheet shows. You know, what we are reporting on is the averages. When it comes to what, so there are two different things here. As a predictor, organizational age and organizational size did show a positive causal effect on every one of the performance measures. So, you know, you could say it's because intentionally those organizations wanted to grow, because I think there are a lot of organizations that have been around a long time and intentionally have not wanted to grow. It's not to say large is the nirvana that everybody should strive for, but what we are seeing is that with the larger organizations, it, it's a complicated formula. The deficits were higher. Actually, the working capital was most, um, so what's most severe was lowest for mid-sized organizations. Small organizations had the highest levels of working capital, followed by large, then small. Uh, so it's not to say that, you know, as you get big, all of your problems go away, but they do tend to have higher performance on each of the measures with age. I think it's an area right for, for more exploration. And one last question. Uh, excuse me, Todd London from Neutrominus. Um, so like Michael the Lark, my um, questions are around individual artists, which as you've said is kind of the, the missing art piece on this. Um, so I'm wondering if there is a way to use these findings for advocacy in some ways. So I think about the premier idea that Michael brought up, and that idea that it doesn't have to be a national premier to bump, which is important to us, though it's a case we would have to make to funders. I guess my real question is about, are there statistics in there, um, like about hiring individual artists versus administrative staff and program staff, relative salaries and artistic pay, um, commission money put out, you know, for those who do new work or, or commission artists or playwrights or whoever. Are there ways to break this down so that those of us who don't sell things, who aren't selling tickets, who this doesn't really apply to, can use it for advocacy for individual artists? Um, thank you for the, for the question. Within the data set, so, right, so we have three different sources for organization level data. National Center for Chapel Statistics, we don't have any information on that kind of compensation, only for like the top five employees or so at an, at an institution. Within the CDP data, we don't have, we have total compensation, but we don't have how much do you pay on average per artist, or what is the range of pay per artist? We don't necessarily have that. 
of the three theater communications group over time has paid the most attention to kind of getting a finer grain level of detail on number of in-house artists versus contracted artists. Uh, you know, with the CDP, it's a work in progress, and I know that there are going to be changes made to it moving forward. You know, that's an area, in, in thinking of advocacy, if it's important to have that data, then to voice that to CDP, that that's important data to be collected. Because I agree, if, if there are many, many artists in the market, but nobody's getting paid a livable wage, is there also going to be then a lot of churn? and stability? Or is it a community where there are many, many artists being hired from the outside, but the local artists aren't being hired? That data I don't necessarily have to answer, and I wish I did. Right, because that, I mean, that would seem to me to relate to excellence, that if you, mm -hmm. could, if you could look at those excellent organizations and see that, um, and also obviously help. Right. Uh, because it's in a bigger organization. And, and again, you know, there are so many different efforts that are about what is the impact of the arts on communities, whether it's economic impact studies or there are so many other research centers and efforts going on that are really focused on that. We didn't feel the need to recreate that wheel. They do a great job with it. Instead, what we're kind of looking at is almost the opposite. It's how does the community impact the health of the arts organizations? And part of that community is you know, independent artists, and that's an area we, where we need to do more work. Okay. I want to thank you all very much for coming this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we'll be here for a while. Please join us at the bar. <laughs>